And Susan, come on up here. And, uh, <laughs> Familiar to many of you, 
uh, when we adopted the 96 Act, we were convinced that competition was going to protect Americans, that the telephone companies would battle it out with the cable companies, that wireless would be substitutable for all these services, and that the magic of the marketplace would take the place of any regulatory oversight. We turned out to be absolutely wrong, because since then, there's been not only great consolidation on the wired side of the internet access marketplace, particularly on the, in the cable world, but also a complete absence of oversight that would insist that every American get access to a reasonable cost. So we have the worst of both worlds, both no competition and no oversight at this point. On the wired side, it's quite clear that uh, we've learned over the last 10 years that cable has won. Cable has won. It was so much cheaper in America to upgrade uh, the, the cable plant to Doctors 3.0 and make sure that the speeds were fast. So much cheaper to do that than for the telephone companies to do the upgrades. The cable just marched in, and uh, now uh, in the last three quarters of 2012, get this, 0.2% of new broadband subscriptions went to the telecoms. Everything else is going to the local cable incumbent um, in America. These guys in the summer will divide up markets, cluster based systems, never enter each other's territories, and perhaps shouldn't it would be inefficient to, but they're subject to no oversight for pricing or quality of service and have no need to make any upgrades at this point. On the wireless side, a very strong uh, duopoly there with AT&T and Verizon, taking at least two-thirds of subscribers. All the free cash flow going on, all the revenue is on the side of Verizon and AT&T. And these two, Groups are now cooperating with each other. So Verizon and Comcast did a deal last year, uh, as well as they're doing a co-market their services, showing that they're not fiercely competing with each other. We might have seen more fiber from Verizon, which would have put pressure on Comcast and AT&T, but they sensibly backed off, seeing how much cheaper it was for the cable guys. And so they cherry-picked some neighborhoods for staying there. Here's the basic story, well known to many of you, from um, uh, FCC, the FCC National Broadband Plan of March 2010, that when it comes to the speed we might have needed five years ago, we could see two competitors, cable and DSL, that was our assumption. These days, 10 megabits per second download speeds, cable, the only choice available for about half the country, but it's the, it's the right most far, it's the real problem. For next generation access, for more than 80% of Americans, their only choice is going to be their local cable incumbent, absent the energy for the new fiber network that uh, we're all talking about in this room. So that's a huge problem for the country. No choice, just cable ever rise to prices, and uh, no move to fiber to the home without a change in policy. This doesn't have to be management, but it requires policy. Life is very good for Comcast and for Time Warner Cable. This could be Time Warner Cable. I just chose Comcast because Captive Audience, the book, talks a lot about the Comcast NBCU merger. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll be book. But average revenue per video customer is just skyrocketing because you can keep charging the same number of people more for services over time. And here's the story of where we came from for, so the telco is getting about half the market back in 2002. Look at the differential now. As people flee DSL, absolutely flee in droves, the cable companies are taking the lion's share of new subscriptions. Here's Brian Roberts, a very smoothly managed company, Comcast, and not a cable company. I was their shareholder, and I'm sure I am. I want them to be doing what they're doing, which is to increase their profits. He's saying, in our footprint, he's saying this to investors, we're about 33% penetrated, we have about third market share for high-speed internet access. Think of this as an internet access company, he's saying. So the goal is 100 or 90. That's the market share we're looking for. We have one competitor. Who's that competitor? Verizon Fios. Only 15% of Comcast's territory includes Verizon competition. Only 11% of Time Warner Cable's territory includes Verizon competition. So 
So the rest of their footprint, and Comcast covers 50 million American homes and 45% of the American population, in that area, it's just Comcast. And he says, I like that position. Well, of course he likes that position. This is terrific. And you know, some people saw me and said, you know, your book is really an argument for buying cable. But it's such a great stock that it's, it's true. Uh, there, since the merger of NBCU, Comcast stock price has gone up 163%. Their market cap now is 100 billion. They're bigger than Home Depot or McDonald's. They're a giant company. And, and again, so smoothly managed, they're never in the news. And that's in their interest to, uh, to say that we're very, very well connected politically. So on the wireless side, uh, this is the Verizon AT&T story. Many people may think of Verizon AT&T as the phone company, and they still do provide a lot of special access and backhaul services, uh, but all of their revenues really are on the wireless side at this point. So there's Verizon in the upper line, more than two thirds of its revenue is now wireless, and AT&T, which has shed fewer of their lines. Verizon's got rid of a lot of their unprofitable copper lines, DSLs. Uh, AT&T has done less of that. But still, Verizon's and AT&T's wireless share is really climbing. Because that's where they can make profits. Again, great American companies doing extremely well, and people are paying more and more for these services. The comments I see online about people despair of how expensive this is, is something we need to harness and turn into the joyful energy that's going to turn the corner on this uh, issue. Here's an alarming chart uh, from an investment analyst for Europe. Wireless revenue per capita descended. For America, wireless revenue per capita accented. Uh, again, making more money for the same number of people. As you can add services, drive people into shared data plans, impose usage caps, all the things that market power allows AT&T and Verizon to do on the wireless side. The major issue confronting us today, I think this is sort of funny, uh, a little um, is that uh, they see themselves as speakers, protected by the First Amendment, and are arguing this fiercely across every part of American government. So at the state level, at the federal level, at the SEC, in front of the courts, Verizon now has a very important case pending in D.C. Circuit where they say, no regulation of us could be constitutional because we are a speaker. We're like the newspaper. We're editing the internet. It is our job to do that for people and the court's job to protect us against any regulatory oversight. This is a big argument and it's sliding on an iceberg across the United States and we have a legal tussle ahead of us to make sure that Americans understand that it's their free speech interests, the free, the free speech of more than 300 million Americans that we should be prioritizing, not the business interests of Verizon and AT&T. So what should we do? We have to be cheerful. We have to be just about to it. I think the victory in Georgia marked a wonderful, energetic moment uh, to lift up this story for the rest of the country, make sure everybody understands what's happened in America, and what's possible, particularly at the local level. So for me, the top priority is a subject that Jim spends his life working on, um, making sure that local communities have the decision-making autonomy to decide for themselves what kinds of communication facilities make sense. Don't have to be things that we own. Do have to be open and fast and price-regulated. We need to make sure that everybody in America, all cities, has have the ability to make that decision for themselves. Right now, as you know, there are 19 or 20 states in, in which it's either difficult or impossible for cities to do this really for themselves. We need to roll back those barriers and increase the number of points of light across the country. So back to the electricity parallel. When electricity first showed up, we thought it was only good for street lamps. We had no imagination. And the electrical companies launched world fairs to show people what it was like to have bright lights in every part of their life 
what it would mean to have electrical in the kitchen, what it would mean to have schools have electricity. We're now in the position of needing world's fairs for fiber connectivity to show people what it's going to be like to have cheap, fast, reliable, always on connection where you don't even have to think of it as an input to your business. Much as we don't think about electricity in this space as an input to what everybody does for job creation, for productivity, all kinds. Those world's fairs, we're looking for them. I think the Kansas City Network for Google is, is an example of world's fair, but there are many local themselves, we need to show them to the Another essential part of this is going to be uh, policy to ensure that when AT&T, Verizon, and Comcast are selling their services, that they're available at a wholesale level for people to attach to, that we acquire the networks. Again, it's all about jobs. So that the spillover effects, the economic knock-on effects of having Price connectivity come to all of us, not just to their shareholders. It's all about money, uh, you know this. And so making access to capital easier for competitive fiber companies and for municipalities who want to do this is an essential element of what needs to happen next. Maybe we need state infrastructure banks that have some skin in the game and are getting access to capital, uh, lowering the barriers, because we know that these investments pay off over time. Not immediately, not in the first quarter, but over maybe a decade. Loan officers need to understand that too, and we need to make sure that capital is theirs. So that's a big step that's essential. <laughs> uh, Comcast services and those of the carriers in general, uh, they have a built in conflict of interest to <coughs> favor their own stuff and to ensure that their own uh, profit interests are served. That's a problem for America. And Nixon, White House, in the 70s, said that the cable connection needed to be separated, conduit from constant, because the risk otherwise was that this gatekeeper control of the single wire to the home would be so great that other businesses depending on it would be unable to attract capital, would be unable to succeed. We're now facing that position um, with these giant carriers. So we need to make sure that the conflict of interest for new networks is uh, eliminated. But finally, and the reason why I'm here, and the reason I care that John's taking pictures of that here, is that uh, we need to get this issue on the Americans' radar screen. It's not now. Most people don't even understand what a problem we have in this country. We haven't made this uh, visceral social issue and that serves the interests of the incumbents who are quite happy with the status quo. It's not on the radar screen for congressmen, for senators, for many local representatives. We need to make this an election issue. In every debate, we need college students asking tough questions, saying that their vote depends on what that person's going to do about fiber access in their local community. We need to make sure that every city council meeting has some element of connectivity in it. It's got to be in the water, in the air. We have lots of work to do on this front because it still sounds slightly geeky. Even the use of the word telecom is probably a mistake. Let's come up with a different word and bring this closer to people so they take it on as their own story. So that's why I wrote Captive Audience, just to get this on the radar screen. I have been delighted with the reception of the so far, but mostly. I'm just humbled by what's possible in America and what you are working on all the time. We brought electricity to this country. It took great political will. It took real heart over many, many years. We can do this with telecommunications as well, seeing the word. We can do this with next generation networks. And all we need to do every night to go home and turn on electric light, that lovely soft it was a public trust to ensure that everybody got that at a reasonable cost. We need to do the same thing in connectivity. So thanks very much. I look forward to talking to you.
about a year ago, you appeared on a television program that you do, and you used the image of a slow boiling frog. And uh, picking up on one of the last points that you made, I think it's important for every one of us in this audience to have a good understanding of what that image was about. And so please elaborate on that. So picture Freddie the Frog, nice smile, his eyes came back one day, his legs extended. And he notices the water is getting warmer, but his legs are comfortable. And it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and he still doesn't do anything all this right in the middle. That frog is getting boiled over time. We have the same problem with the communications policy in America. Over the last 10 years, we've deregulated, we've gotten rid of all oversight, and consolidation has continued the pace. We're getting boiled. But it, it's a small moving story. And so the press doesn't pay attention. People think that there must be something new and smart that's going on out there because we're Americans. And we need to wake up and say, it's a problem. Let's leap out of the warm pond. And this also ties to um, Washington is a warm pond, a very familiar person now. So we'll slap each other back. We need to somehow remove ourselves from this and take charge of this issue. Susan, your book uh, has met with a marvelous outpouring of opposition from the wrong quarters, and uh, I'd like to ask you to respond to some of the criticisms that have been leveled at your book. Uh, let's start with this one. Um, there's the accusation that you are fast and loose with economic terms. You talked about monopolies, you talked about market power, you talked about the cult of strong personalities in Washington, and so on and so forth. Well, you know the difference between a monopoly and an oligopoly. Uh, why did you choose the terminology that, that you chose in uh, describing the world as you see it? I go back to a, a term that's very common in telecommunications policy. I did a natural monopoly, which is where you have a water, which includes very high fixed costs to build, as you all know. And it, as you add each marginal customer, it costs almost nothing to add that, uh, that unit to the <coughs> So large fixed install costs, very sharply declining cost curves, and households that are locked in the grip of this one wire. This natural monopoly existed in the Bell era, and we recreated it now for cable companies without any oversight. It's that term that I have focused on. In their markets, cable is grabbing the lion's share, the lion's share, of the pride of lion's share of, of broadband access in America. And uh, there are no substitutes for it. There's no real competitive pressure, no pressure to do upgrading. So that is, from the perspective of the consumer, a monopoly. No ability to raise prices without oversight, no substitutes putting any pressure on The Wall Street Journal hired the American Enterprise Institute to do a um, review of my book. The, the headline of the, of the review was Three Cheers for Old You know, maybe that's great for, the, for these companies, uh, that they are very, very large and barely tussling with each other. It's not great for the American consumer. A lived experience for consumers. Another criticism is that uh, you talk about cable being dominant, and the criticism is, well, they've got to compete. They, you know, they, they look at what we, the crap that we call broadband today, and say there's plenty of competition for that. What are they missing? They're missing the future which is that, uh, yes, a DSL would be perfectly adequate for feverishly checking Facebook and sending emails and you know, keeping on top of uh, low bandwidth applications. So what's coming, though, is presence, video, video conferencing, two-way streams, so you're both a publisher and a receiver of information. 
everything that the rest of the developed world is focused on is only possible with very high capacity, low latency networks. And it's that market that I'm really interested in making sure we get right. And it's that market in which we have really no competition and secondary services. So we need to have a little bit more imagination about, about what's possible. And that you need those high capacity wires. And it's fiber that we all need in order for uh, next generation applications to be formed in America. We were responsible for the first generation of American internet innovation. We will not be responsible for the second generation unless we face this situation and do the upgrade. Late in uh, 2008, you and Kevin Wurbach were the co-chairs of the FCC uh, piece of the transition team, and Mandy went into the White House and uh, served as a special assistant to President Obama. You went into those positions full of enthusiasm, uh, with lots of great ideas, and then it came out after a, a year in the White House. Can you share what that period of time was like for you? Coming in, what you saw when you were there, and then when you came out, what what you saw then at that point in time? <laughs> well, I remember spending a uh, good amount of time with you, Angel Man, and lots of our settings in this community. Yes, I went in with great energy. I've never felt more nervous in my life. I felt I had a chance to serve. And I had no uh, ties, no access to grinds. It was a great privilege to go in. And I threw everything overboard, my health, my family, my friends, everything just went away. Because we had this new president. I remember seeing him in Grand Park with his two beautiful children and his lovely wife, uh, just bursting into tears, thinking this was the most smooth that had happened in my life. And I couldn't believe that I got to be in Washington, not a little person. I just got a call in the middle of the night asking me to come. Um, so, I came. so I still feel that great sense of privilege and honor to have been part of the administration and to get the opportunity to serve all of you, sir. You know how this feels. It's a great honor. And uh, as I exited, I felt the need to explain to people just how bad the market situation had gotten before communications and to make it clear that. Giant mergers of which the Congress and NBC merger was just one had been sweeping the landscape for a decade, and that the image Americans had of themselves as the leaders for internet access in the world was simply not true. But I wanted to explain it in an accessible, cheerful way, and I, I feel very grateful that I got the opportunity. <coughs> You've seen lots of the, the Federal Communications Commission, both from the White House down, and uh, you've interacted uh, with Julius many times over the years. Um, are you disappointed in the FCC or the FCC that you've seen the last four years? So the news is out uh, just yesterday that Mr. Chankowski will be announcing today that he is uh, stepping down. Uh, Julius Janikowski is an unfailingly gracious, kind man. Uh, he would be delighted to be here to talk all of you. He came into a situation in which he felt that his um, freedom of action was quite constrained. He took on, and the commission took on, some titanic problems, the universal service funding issues that the devil the commission for decades. I felt like about 15 years ago. He, he had launched and completed a, a very large committee taking that on and, and really trying to make it more national. And you should be paid for that. He, uh, quite, you know, was quite involved in the National Broadband Plan that was issued in 2010. For all the other failings of the National Broadband Plan, he puts the issue on the map, and Mr. Jodakowski himself speaks often of the importance of high capacity networks, and I'm grateful to know that. So it's very difficult to serve in these jobs. It's really hard. And um, we should applaud people who are willing to do it, did do it. So thanks. Well, 
by the way, just as an observation to this group, um, also earlier this week, Robert McDowell, the senior Republican on the FCC, also announced that he's leaving. So depending on when these departures take effect, and depending on when new nominees are offered, we could have a, an FCC headed by Megan Clyburn, a great friend of all of ours, with Jessica Rosenworcel, who uh, was uh, the uh, aide to Michael Cox, and who is Michael Cox with a lot more current savvy because of uh, her roles on the Hill before coming back to the FCC, and one Republican. And uh, so we're going to have, at least for a period of time, a very friendly FCC, and I hope they're aggressive about acting on uh, some of the uh, items that are very important to us. And uh, I, I, I certainly share your view that uh, this FCC, the current FCC under uh, Julius had tremendous potential and ran into uh, the reality of how, how difficult it is to get things done. Um, you, just say no uh, if you don't want to do this, but I was going to uh, ask you to uh, comment on what you would like to see the next FCC do. Um, I know you won't comment, I won't ask you to comment on the uh, candidates who are being discussed as uh, potential chairs. Uh, many of us wish it were you. Uh, and I, I would say yes. We all agree on that. <laughs> but what would you like to see the FCC do and what do you think they can do if they were aligned to do it? America can do that. And the next FCC chairman, chairperson, whoever this is, has to say, there's a new sheriff in town. This is a serious set of social policies that we have let incrementally wander over the last 10 years. We need to ensure that service and additional cost is available. What are the levers we can pull to do this? We can preempt these state laws that make it difficult for communities to do this for themselves. We can ensure that competitive fiber providers get the access to polls, the access to programming, everything else they need to lower the barriers to serving local markets. We can make sure that every American, every American has access to a set level of service. And let's say what that is. I think it should be 100 megabits per second symmetrical. Let's just say it. Why not set that standard and then every other policy follows from that? So the next chairman has a lot of work to do and there's a lot of underbrush to clear out but it can be done through a soft set of sort of Kingsbury agreement um, handshakes with the industry because those will always be voluntary, they can always be avoided. This needs to be done with the power that the Communications Act gives the commission. The commission has all the tools it needs, it just needs to take the tools out of the drawer and use them. And again, back to the critic, the criticisms of your book. Uh, some uh, some folks agree with your characterization of the problem we have, but then take issue with your solutions to it. Uh, at one extreme, people say that you're talking about nationalizing the telecommunications industry, or they say that you're talking about the federal government somehow stepping in to build a nationwide fiber network and spending but it's $90 billion on doing that. What, what are you really saying, and how practical are the solutions that, that you're suggesting? Uh, thanks for asking that. So I have no interest in nationalizing these big companies. We don't do that in America. Um, what I do have an interest in making sure happens is that each one of these unique networks is built to a standard that makes sense for the country as a whole, that they interoperate, that they interconnect, and that over time, the whole country gets this service through however, whatever members we to do it. It's going to take subsidies, it's going to take uh, real um, loan guarantees from probably the federal government to make sure it 
happens for those areas that are very expensive to serve. But for the areas that are economic to serve, I just want to see fast, competitive, overseen service from whatever source. The federal government messed up badly not for the last 10 years in laying this industry drift. I don't think they'd be very good at running the network. I, I really think you And related to what we can be doing for the future, uh, when you were in the White House, I remember one of your tasks was to uh, sit on a committee of many different agencies and look at how they interact with one another. But I think it would be fair to say that those of us out there see a lot of the uh, silo thinking still out there. Healthcare systems want their independent network and transportation people want independent networks and EPA uh, won't let uh, funds that are billions of dollars of funds paying for uh, sewers and water system upgrades won't let those be used for communication services. What did you see when you were uh, trying to coordinate these agencies and how much room is there for doing things better? A lot of opportunity for rationalizing how policy is viewed by these giant federal agencies. You know, in the next year, there was an Office of Technology Assessment located in the White House, which had real authority to coordinate the agency's activities. We need to return that function to the, to the central uh, part of the executive branch. And here's why. Um, absence, some question from the West Wing, I now understand this, agencies just to elbow each other, fight for turf, make life miserable for each other. And a strong hand is needed to say, this is a measure priority. You know, we have someone working on energy policy at the heart of the White House. You need someone working on telecommunications policy at the heart of the not just someone. People with a staff who can ensure that as money go out, goes out, programs are built uh, across the agencies that include high speed internet access. And it's done, everybody's marching in the same direction. And it's done in a very clear, coordinated, thoughtful, yet even patient way. Because things also move slowly. That's the other problem with like planning agencies wander. Um, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity for more intelligent federal policy. Susan, I can ask you one more question, uh, and don't hold me to that. But I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to invite the audience to participate in the next half hour of discussion. If I'm a member of this audience and I want to raise my hand and get personally involved and take personal responsibility for making this world a better world, um, what could I do? How could I work with you? What, what needs to be done? Well, luckily, no one does anything alone. So you and I are carefully coordinated with Chris Mitchell. I'd love to talk to you, and I'd love to talk to all of you. The idea is, I think, uh, should be, uh, there's John in the back room, my telecommunications equality project. Let's make sure that in every community, there's a meetup, a locus, a way of uh, reaching people who care about communications policy and ad adequate access in their community. Uh, that we're all feeding information to each other, getting tips about ways to uh, be, what, you know, getting tips about uh, what problems, what lessons learned from private networks that are wrong. I'd like to see lots of resources poured into 
pulling ourselves together as a community to do that. <coughs> to learn from each other while allowing for a lot of diversity among approaches to networks. Maybe serving as a buy-in cooperative, that would be helpful. Um, but uh, some coordination of free and ordered space is the way I like to think about it. Raising your hand, letting Jim know, letting me know, letting John know that you're interested, sharing materials, getting human stories out that will help younger people particularly get involved in this issue, uh, having lists of questions to ask, and lots of resources about the best ways to do this. It's really just about money and good judgment in the end. And we can spread so much that's been learned, so much more efficiently than we do. And most important, we can approach this with optimism and energy. Absolutely. And what's our choice, right? Okay. Uh, who has questions for Susan? Gordon, let's start us off. Yeah. I'll read the question. Go ahead. First question for Susan. Uh, Gordon, identify yourself for the audience, please, for those who don't know you. I'm Gordon Weiss. Gordon Weiss. Yeah. Gordon Caverly. I'm the regional vice president for Mid-State Consultants out of Michigan. I've my life in the telecommunications field. Used to be a captain. Um, the question I have, Susan, is uh, with, with your presentation, you showed uh, Comcast being a dominant uh, moving towards predatory capitalistic measures and uh, uh, working the other uh, carriers out there. With AT&T announcing a $66 billion bill in the next three years, upgrading their U-verse and upgrading their uh, wireless network LTE, which is going to be delivering 1 to 1.5 gigabit per second, and Verizon already there within the next 12 months. How do you think that shift will take place between what Comcast has already accomplished versus what the other carriers are trying to accomplish? Did you all hear that? No. Okay. Um, and Gordon, I'll try to be fair. No, no, I won't. I'll hand you the mic. It's going to do it. Um, the issue is with uh, AT&T announcing a $66 billion bill over the next three years, which is predominantly in their wireless 4G bill and in their U-verse platform. And AT&T, I mean Verizon coming up with uh, uh, rolling out their 4G LTE advanced by within the next 12 to 18 months, how does that compare with Comcast market share and the impact of that uh, against Comcast and what do you think is going to happen with that market shift? Let me add to that question. Uh, in, implicit in this is that LTE is the world's next great thing. Uh, would you also address the role of LTE in the competitive world that we've been talking about today. So to be totally clear, these two markets are separate. They're also complementary. They work together. So you can think of um, wired access as the runway. And we need a lot of runways around the United States. And they need to be fiber. And they need to be high capacity, low latency. That's going to make possible wireless access, which we love for mobility. Fantastic for mobility. Um, the, but the airplane that lands on the runway, if that is as the wireless excitement, is it great to have an airplane? But you can't have an airplane doing anything too effective without the runway underneath. So I see LTE as a an addition to the wireless infrastructure we need. Right now, Verizon and AT&T impose usage caps that may be extraordinarily expensive to use a wireless device to actually engage in a video conference call, watch a movie, watch a game. You'll hit your usage cap almost immediately, and you'll be running into very high overage costs. So Netflix, the most popular application by right now in America on wired internet connection, on a mobile connection, usage is 
the low single digits. That's because it's so expensive to use on that side. So it's a compliment. 83% of people who have smartphones also have a wire connection at home. And in Seoul, people told me I would never rely on just a wireless device. I would always have a wire connection in my home. So I see what AT&T is doing as just fulfilling the plans it already had. Uverse does not substitute for what the cable guys offer. The cramped uploads are really striking. Um, you really can't do much on the upload side of Uverse. And the download speed of Uverse right now also is not substitutable for the speeds available over the cable. So cable wins on the wire side. You can see this on the take up of Uverse. It's been around for several years now, but its take up is just getting to the point now where Verizon has been for a long time with BIOS. BIOS is much more popular service because the capacity is so much greater. So, Uverse can't compete with cable, wireless can't compete with cable direct head to head. They're useful complements, and there's going to be a lot of co marketing going on. But for all these players, they have sufficient market power to just keep raising prices without oversight and charging the same number of people more for the same service, and no particular incentive to install fiber anywhere to make sure that their um, towers have the capacity they need to provide us even with the wireless speeds that are possible. So we're stuck. We're in a bit of a trough right now. I don't see any competitive pressure on what we can do. And, and also, if you step back and you look at this question from the standpoint of how our mantra, jobs and community economic development and well-being, um, what's the role of wireless in uh, community economic development? Substantially, you're more productive if you're able to keep in touch with people in a normal way. Look, I want to I'd say that wireless is useless. It's not at all. It's, just, it's a complement with the need. It's, a, it's additive to the wires that we're going to need around the country, which right now are subject to now depression. Let me rephrase my question because I, I think I want to get at an important point here. Take Bristol, for example, which because of its network has attracted hundreds of high paying jobs. That network sets it apart from other communities and it can look at its record and demonstrate that its network brought people into the community, into the whole region. Um, how, how do we envision wireless making that kind of contribution to either local or regional competitiveness, especially if everybody has it nationwide? Okay. So, it's the wire that is making those jobs happen. The wire also makes possible potential lots of wireless competition. So in, in Seoul and in Stockholm, a bunch of cities, many LTE providers because there's open fiber available to them to connect. So I don't want to put these stories in opposition to each other. It's additive, but the basic thing is the wire, is making sure that the network is really fast and available to competitors to serve. And as you know, here year ago in our uh, TV program, when was the last time anybody applied for a job on their handheld? So my question relates a little bit to the previous question because um, it is true that the wireless industry is talking about speeds of a gigabit over wireless. And it seems to me that when we talk about things like that, when the cable industry says we've got 100 megabit speeds, part of the problem we have is that we're really obscuring the reality that you can you know, bench test a cable motor in the lab <clears throat> under optimal conditions over a foot of coaxial cable, and you can probably get 100 megabits. But on that network deployed in our communities, you will never, ever, ever get what you're going to get over fiber. And it's, that is just the reality of physics is the same thing with wireless. I'm sure there are all kinds of tests we can show that coming wireless technologies will deliver all kinds of speeds. But as they are deployed within the realities of the spectrum, 
in the field and weather and wind and all those things that's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I, one of our concerns is we hear commissioners of the FCC saying, oh, all these homes can get 100 megabits, but we know that cable is a shared medium. And it's, it's not happening. We're not getting speeds like that. Can you maybe just speak to that issue of the technologies and maybe unpacking a little bit some of the maybe vendor-driven hype around the technologies? Thanks. And, and I add as a side to that, our competitor nations in Europe and Asia get this. And they're not pretending that certain technologies deliver what fiber does. To start with the last point first, so in Europe, wireless operators are actually asking for greater fiber because they understand that they're a complement to fiber. They want to see open fiber and they can be next to it. So the thing about use of frequencies is that it, they're traveling through the airwaves spectrum and uh, they need the, the signal degrades very sharply over distance, very sharply, and also can be interfered with by things like trees and wind and you know, buildings. Um, and so, although you might get point to point transmissions using the airwaves where you have clear line of sight and a really powerful signal over a whole bunch of bandwidth, you might be able to carry a, whole, a lot of information. That's not the situation in the field where networks are, towers are routinely shared by lots and lots of people. Uh, where there could be interference all over the place and where um, they don't have available to them the bandwidth, the many uh, different frequencies that you need for that perfect transmission of a gigabit of information. So by contrast, inside the uh, glass tube that is fiber, lasers can send, we believe, an unlimited amount um, they, you can compress dice photonics if you are just uh, speeding along so quickly that the information carrying capacity of fiber, we believe, is future proof for the next 50 or 100 years. And uh, once the fiber is moving the ground, 80% of that price of the fiber there is labor, it is jobs. So there's a big job component to this. Once it's there, it can be easily, inexpensively, both of these can be upgraded with new photonics to make it carry even more information. And here's the magic of it, that inside that glass tube, no interference. You know, this degrading over distance in the leaves and the wind is not happening inside the fiber. So fiber, just by leaps and bounds, a better technology than either HFC, the cable connections, which are shared in the input left level, uh, much more current uploads than we see with fiber, which is symmetrical. And also, in which the cable operator has a built-in conflict of interest, they've got four of hundreds of channels on the internet access. So just four out of the 250 channels. Everything else is video. So it's almost as if the internet access on the cable pipe is like a little kid trying to get home from school with bullies between him and his mother. Um, there are a lot of potential bullies there in that cable pipe. That, you know, letters that could be pulled to smush degrade, otherwise affect what's possible over that cable connection. So you could probably watch some uh, video on a wireless connection very compressed. You have to be the only person standing next to that tower, you know? Um, and it is not a substitute for what's possible over fiber. And as Joanne said, other countries give us, for some reason, we think that America is always in the lead, and so therefore our communications networks must be in the lead. It's just not true. Well, now we have several. Go ahead. Okay. Um, she's stuck here. Okay. That's fine. Susan Murphy, with the Appalachian Regional Commission. It is so good to see you again. Um, compare for me a little bit the on the one side, you have uh, lowering the barriers for competition so that you can get more players in the, in the in the space versus the concept of maybe, especially if you want to talk about putting out a new fiber network that currently isn't there, you know, maybe the concept of 
is there a national monopoly or should we have a national duopoly? And is the answer really lowering the barriers of competition to get more players in the game? Or is the, is, is the answer really getting more regulation in place so that the current players are going to have to play by, let's say, a different set of rules? Thanks, Mark. It's great to see you. Um, here's here's what I'd like to see. I think Jim and I may differ on this. Where it's possible, unions should be focused, I think, on building fiber rings that are at the lowest level, dark fiber, unlit, maybe just access to conduit, and ensuring whether built by a private actor or by the media itself that the specs in place allow for competitors, retail providers, to use that easily. Lining up a couple retail providers right away to serve anchor institutions so they have bills and subscriptions so they'll do well. But getting that wholesale facility in place for me seems to be a key in places where it's possible to use the density for competitors to arise. So that requires both bravery on the part of the community plus regulatory oversight to make sure that the network they call for meets those specifications and as raw as possible so that competitors on top of it can offer differentiated services. Those ISPs then pay back the city for the cost of building the wholesale network. This is what happens in Stockholm, what happened in Seoul. By the way, the mayor of Seoul, South Korea, decided that his city, in which 50% of South Koreans live, his city needed a wholesale facility going to the subways. It was illegal to do it at the time. He just went ahead. Now, different kind of countries, right? But still, that's what's made possible, this situation in Seoul, where you have a choice of three fiber to home providers that are using that wholesale facility to provide services really cheap, 30 bucks a month, includes TV. And they show up in a day because competition is so fierce, they know they have to be there. They're going to get your, your service. So where it's possible, that's my ideal. Where it's not possible to have both wholesale and retail operators, making it possible for a competitor to serve the whole of market makes sense, subject to oversight. It doesn't have to be incumbent. That's all I'm suggesting. Only getting that money to incumbents is a problem because they have no particular incentive as they stand to, uh, to do a great job. We're a big country. There are going to be different solutions in different places. Where it's possible, I'd like to see wholesale facilities in place. And uh, Susan, I don't disagree. Uh, I do agree. Uh, I'm agnostic as to business model. Um, and uh, I think not everywhere will wholesale models work today. The, the records thus far, wholesale models uh, has not been a, a, a record of glowing success. But I think we're in, we're in the transitional stage. We'll get there. In the meanwhile, um, communities have to have the flexibility to do what works for them. Uh, just to go back to Bristol again, Bristol started out wanting to do a wholesale model, but could not get a cable company to uh, come in and compete with the incumbent. Couldn't get a phone company that, that would work with it and it had to answer for itself the question, do I just give up or do I go to retail? And it has been spectacularly successful over the years. There are many other communities that are approaching the challenge in different ways. Many of the Andrews, Andrew Cohill's clients, for example, do this on an incremental basis and step into it. Um, the, to me, the question is, each situation is different, what works, is what I favor for that particular community. And ideally, we will get to a place as our understanding of the value of these networks increases as we begin to look to them, not just to serve triple play, but also to serve multiple uses, transportation, energy, environmental, uh, healthcare, all of these as we make our uh, networks more uh, robust and uh, valuable to more users, all of which will contribute to the sustainability of the network eventually. I think we will get to the point where we have 
networks that are uh, open to everyone. It may be that in some communities, the community has to be a retail provider and at the same time open the network to others for uh, multiple reasons or multiple persons. So I think we're in complete agreement that um, what works is what it's in for. And that, and that the ultimate goal are open, affordable, wholesale networks. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Brian Mathbone with the NC Broadband Division of the North Carolina Department of Commerce. And I really like your idea about 100 megabits symmetrical connectivity for everybody, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that that uh, creates already we have the urban markets, there's a lot of money to be made, and rural markets, there's a lot of money to be lost. And I see a future where the urban markets get faster and the rural markets stay slow, widening the digital divide. How do you think we can address that? Do you think we need to have a carrier of last resort type model that requires carriers who serve urban markets but also serve rural markets? You know, these aren't new questions. We, our telephone system was the envy of the world when it was introduced. And we had a standard of service for everybody in the country. We cross-subsidized uh, to make sure that people in rural areas would not be paying exorbitant amounts uh, by charging urban customers more. We just need to replicate that. We did it before. It, we, you do it by asking ISPs in urban areas to make contributions to a universal service fund. Because we're not going to have a single monopoly of service <coughs> over the country. We don't want that. You synthetically create that by cross-subsidizing, but very consciously, explicitly. Not doing it through a series of implicit sort of understood handshakes, but saying our goal as a country is that everybody gets X. We're going to make sure that happens by pulling all the levers we have. But once you set the standard, you can do it, and then you set a date by which you're going to accomplish that. Remember the digital television transition? Very difficult, took a long time. Only by setting a date certain for that event did the equipment manufacturers and everybody else line up to make sure it happened. We need to do that now with the cut over to symmetrical service for all Americans that's adequately fast and upgradable over time so we can keep up with the rest of the country, uh, the rest of the world. I'd just like to note an irony. We have no major city that has the kind of robust fiber connectivity that we would like to see. If you take a look at the top 20, top 30 cities around the world, none of our cities are there. Uh, and it, it, ironically, the fastest growing markets for fiber to home are rural areas where the competition is not what it is in the major cities. So as we're thinking about where we want to go, we need to not forget about the major cities and we need to get them there as well. Uh, Ken Feldman, uh, a quick comment and a question for Susan. Um, as I was listening to uh, Susan talk about how we need to change the dialogue and educate most of America about these issues, it reminded me that not too long ago, there were a number of us who were wondering why our country did not have a national broadband plan and, and what was it going to take to get that. And in the, in the same way that, that sometimes Susan may appear like a Pied Piper um, changing the dialogue um, on broadband, um, Jim Ballard was the Pied Piper of the National Broadband Plan. And in the same way that we thought, what is it going to take to get this to happen? Um, it, it, Jim set the stage and, and was a great example to convince us that it could happen. It's not a perfect plan, but at least we have one now. And, and I think the message to all of us is, um, there's a little piece that we can all do that will eventually change that dialogue. So Susan, thank you for beating the drum on that. So here's my question, to, and, and I'm sorry if this gets in the weeds to the non-lawyers in the room, but uh, one of the things you said was that the FCC has the tools right now, and they just need to take them out. And so my question to you is, they have, in my opinion, screwed up so badly with this Title I classification of broadband, how do you 
recommend that they use the tools or what are the tools that you think they have that will avoid any progressive decision going to the DC circuit with a 70% chance of the industry being successful and getting a decision saying you didn't have the authority to do that. <laughs> so uh, over the last 10 years we've gotten into this ridiculous situation where uh, so Powell's, uh, Michael Powell's FCC uh, back in 2002 deregulated this entire sector and said high-speed internet access is just like a website for this hotel. No difference. It's an information service, right? That step has led to a series of regulatory gymnastics as the FCC tries to say, okay, we're deregulatory, but yet we feel the need to regulate in a few ways. Things like 911 service, you know, Kalia is another example of this. Um, consumer protection generally. So trying to pretend to not regulate with one hand while regulating with the other has led them into a terrible legal penalty. And that's reaching its climax now in the DC Circuit. Yeah, you will see argument in the Verizon case uh, in this, during the summer. So then we have this problem. Let's say the FCC loses on its regulatory gymnastics, it's the nickname this Title I, um, in, in the DC Circuit this summer. Then there's a void. What do we do? How can it be that the communications regulator has no authority to say anything about high-speed internet access when that is the common medium for everything we do in this country? And it is that moment that will test the mental, the spirit, the strength of the commission. Because they could say, things have changed. We may have been right in 2002 that there was enough competition that we didn't need to have any oversight over high-speed that's no longer the case. And even if, we, if there is some competition in some isolated points, this is now our new company. You should used to have telephone service. That's disappearing. We need to make sure that everybody has the basic communications facility. These days, that's in the protocol, that's the device that you can access. Connection. We reclassify. They can do that administratively. They can just say, Title II covers these services. And they can forbear, that's the way they'll do this, back off from imposing everything that's imported into telephone regulation in the high speed internet access world. They could do this, and they would be upheld by courts because the Supreme Court has said you've got a good reason for doing what you're, if you change your mind, you get to change your mind, but if you've got a good reason for changing your, your mind, that's fine. And the FCC has plenty of reasons to change its mind on the decision made in 2002. So that, and from that decision to reclassify, all kinds of things fall. We, universal service starts to make much more sense. Uh, everything to do with uh, public safety and reporting requirements comes back in. Interconnection is becoming a problem. There are now rural phone calls that aren't being completed because networks don't adequately interconnect. That's a disaster for the country. And those interconnection obligations fall off from regulatory oversight. Public safety, interconnection, you know, uh, unbundling all of this could be part of the regime, but the FCC can then decide which of those elements to use. Right now, it's just like it's twirling in space above its actual authority in the, in the act, and it's a, it's a terrible problem. Any questions? Good morning, I'm uh, Mark Williams with Key Visions. Um, <clears throat> question uh, about fiber to the home. And uh, by the way, I'm a great advocate of fiber to the home. I work in the industry four years or so and, and work with it a lot. But here's the question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it's all about money and your judgment. When it comes to fiber to the home, the telephone companies and munis as well have their own. The big issue is that last connection to the home. That's where the problem is in the whole ROI. It's very expensive. To, to deploy fiber to the home. The backbone infrastructure, not so much. You can prove that in pretty well in all the communities that do this. That's okay. I'm concerned about how we, if we, if we push from a regulatory standpoint to, um, to make the phone companies do fiber to the home, how are we going to price it? How are we going to fund it? You know, that, that's a good question. Now I'm a proponent. Yeah. Right. This is a compare to what question in many ways. What, you know, it was expensive to build roads, extremely expensive. We never would have built them if we'd known how expensive it was. It was expensive to build the Hoover Dam, all kinds of things. 
this what low class pitch loan is expensive if you think of yourselves as a media company, getting immediately quarterly returns and your investment comes back right away. It's not expensive at all if you think about the long term spill owners to the community of attracting jobs, attracting people who will stay in that community, increasing the sort of social capital, the fiber of that community. There, it more than pays for itself, but over time. So that's why one of my big suggestions here is local infrastructure banks that have some skin in the game see the compelling case for this and are willing to loan out local patient capital that then gets paid back by the community over time. Now, AT&T and Verizon may be willing to do this, but I'll bet you there are competitors who are not trying to get 40% margins which is where AT&T and Verizon are now on the wireless side, but instead see themselves as more of a gravel pit. Gravel pits can be great business. We need to just reshape our thinking about what is expected from that last mile. And here comes Jim. <laughs> well, we've run out of time, and uh, uh, I am sure that uh, Susan will be, or will you be for a few more minutes to answer individuals. John is waving the book back there. It is a great read, and uh, it is on Amazon. Uh, so uh, we highly recommend it. You'll, you'll find the uh, investment very worthwhile. So please join me in thanking Ida Tarbell. And we wish you as much success as Ida has, because we've all got a stake in it. Thank you.